Good evening, everybody. I am so excited about tonight, and I hope you guys are too. Um, we have a fabulous speaker for you, um, Dr. Nell, Dr. Danielle Thompson. We'll talk about her in a second. Just wanted to fill you guys in on some things that are coming up for Kinder Learning, and I appreciate you guys um, tuning in to all of our webinars. So upcoming in the next couple months, we're gonna be having webinars on fluency, on how to do fluency, and we'll also have a click. If you've attended our Kendor Learning Instructional Communities, we're gonna have one um, to go along with fluency. We're gonna also have one to go on along with activities. So we have a bunch of activities that we wanna share, you know, kind of at the beginning of the year. So you have some other, other things to do um, in the classroom. We have a whole um, year lined up and we'll be posting them soon on our website. We're, so we're excited about that. We also have some trainings coming up. The end of this week, um, on Thursday and Friday, we're doing our wordplay vocabulary class, and it is a full day class, and it's specifically designed for third grade through eighth grade, um, but I've done it a lot in high school, too. You'd be surprised how many kids need it at different levels, but um, that is a, a part of our certification program, but you can jump in and take it at any time if you're interested. And so it's uh, vocabulary, morphology, some etymology mixed in with some of the phonology, right? So we need to be able to decode in order to figure out meaning. So that's what that class entails. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or wanna join us last minute. Next week is our Kendor Kingdom part one. And that is a three day uh, class that's all day. We also have one that is going to be in the evenings in September. So you can choose the day or the evening if you'd like. Um, that comes with everything, like everything you need, games, activities, uh, controlled readers, you name it. Uh, and so it's, it's laid out for different grade levels. We have uh, kindergarten, first and second grade, and then we also have a remediation plan. So that's what that training entails. A lot of you that I saw registered have already been through our part one, and um, a lot of you also wordplay. Feel free to, if you want to, um, come back and join us again. So if anybody needs a refresher, they need to come back a second time or pop in and out uh, for different content, you are welcome to do it. We will put you on our distribution list and, and make sure that you uh, get all the communication about and uh, logging back in. Uh, we also have part two is gonna be coming up in the second semester. So I still talk in semesters, I don't know why, but I do. So in the spring, we'll be doing part two, um, also probably a day and evening class. And then we rotate through kind of those things uh, because we do a lot of stuff on site at school. So the ones I'm telling you about are independent trainings. Uh, so a lot of our trainings are actually in a district. So I don't post those online. Um, so uh, the other thing, let's see, what else is going on? Um, Oh yeah, people are asking about our coupons because we usually have a coupon. So currently it is decodable and that gets you a free decodable when you order something on our website. We're, uh, we just got a new reprint and so we're giving away our old reprint. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, words are spelled correctly, <laughs> but if you want one, you can pick one from our list of decodables and, and use that coupon code decodable. All right, so let me start our introduction of uh, Dr. Thompson. Okay, so, and um, oh, let me do this first. Um, the recording will be available. So we will be sending out the recording uh, once we get it uploaded to our YouTube channel. So we'll send you the link. So give us a day or so before you start emailing. Um, I love the enthusiasm, but it's a lot of emails. <laughs> so if you'll wait and send, uh, wait till Wednesday um, or just check back on the, on our YouTube channel and they'll be up there uh, for you to look at. We will send you immediately uh, the slides. So you'll have the presentation slides. You'll also get immediately your certificate of attendance if you attend tonight and you've registered. And then we'll give you, um, you know, a follow-up that has been posted to the YouTube with the link um, or you can check back there however you um, prefer to find the recording. Cause I know there's gonna be, I've seen her presentation. It is fabulous. She is amazing. She's so knowledgeable. Um, and you are gonna wanna show it to all your friends. So uh, we'll make sure you get everything that you need. Uh, we will have a, we will 
do this for about an hour, and then we'll have a question and answer. I will be looking at your questions and going and monitoring the chat while she's talking, and then I'll be able to respond to you um, for some of the things that I know about, and then we'll save those questions until the end and ask um, Nell to, to you know, answer those for you. So feel free to put all of your questions in the chat, and then as soon as she begins, I can um, keep track of those and make sure that we get those all answered. So without further ado, let me introduce her. So Dr. Danielle Nell Thompson, hello. So now you get to um, listen to me say great things about you. Thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, but she is um, a PhD, but she's also a speech language pathologist, uh, an educational consultant, a teacher of teachers, <laughs> and insati insatiably curious about all things that make people's lives better. She is truly an inspired human and an agent of positive change, working to revolutionize the way teachers think and apply their knowledge for the benefit of all children in their classrooms. As a speech language pathologist and teacher, she's taught and assessed pre-K, elementary, and middle school students for 10 years in at-risk environments from Alaska to Mississippi in the public schools, head starts, and private practice. Dr. Thompson's vision includes being of service to the educators around the world in her own backyard and, and you know, Montana, which is amazingly beautiful, um, by the way, and I'll give you a little tidbit about that in a second. So um, Dr. Thompson works to build educator knowledge in the science of reading and in taking information to application. Through this work, she has helped schools and districts create systems that catch struggling students early, provide students with the intensive interventions necessary and the wraparound care to reduce risk. She has also created a system to build literacy leaders who in turn build high reliability systems. She also created a system to build literacy leaders who turn to the greater good of teaching beyond um, the creation of that is the Montana Structured Literacy Institute that she created in 2019, the Montana Writing Intensive in 2020, and the Montana Dyslexia Guidance Document and Assessment List. Lastly, Dr. Thompson serves as an editor for the Reading League Journal, the president of the Reading League Montana. She's a member of the ASHA Conference Literacy Assessment Guide Team and ASHA Language and Literacy Reviewer and a contributing author to the science of reading curriculum for various district and state grants. Now, this is the exciting thing. She also has started the Big Sky Literacy Summit, which is this September 10th and 11th. And um, it's like the perfect event because it's an absolutely beautiful location um, with amazing speakers and, and tons of knowledge to be had. So um, if you have your you know, fall break early, <laughs> so hard to the loan, um, you know, you can feel free to join. And I will send you a link to all that information in the follow-up email so you have it if you want to share it with other people you know um, that are interested in getting more PD in this area. But if Danielle isn't working in classrooms with educators and students, she's pondering and studying, translating research into practice, doing small research project, projects, and building useful tools that support teachers as they transform instruction through personal change, focus, and deliberate practice. And she does not sleep and uh, does actually all of these amazing things. I've known her for, I don't know, when did, I first, when did we first meet, 20 years ago? Yeah, long time ago. Like, yeah, I know. Um, so, so she's super impressive. There are some other things, but she's gonna be talking about those projects in her presentation. So I kind of left them out. So she had some surprises for you. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Wahoo. Thank you so much. That was such a kind introduction. And um, I'll be welcome, here to everybody. Answer. Wow. 500 people are out there. I'm guessing you're from across the United States. So um, really, I, I go by Nell. A lot of people call me Dr. Nell, but I am here for you today. So I'm going to share with you my PowerPoint. And yes, you will have two documents when this show is over. Um, so you can um, maximize your learning and take that to task and share it with your leaders, do whatever you need to do to make sure um, this information gets transferred into practice because that's what we're all about here. Um, and a big thunderstorm just started here in Montana. So I hope all things stay okay in the, in the digital world. So 
Early identification. Uh, this is really about this early bracket of, of children in our lives. The students that are in those in age groups four to eight is really primarily what I'm addressing today um, of language and reading difficulties. And this is really going to include dyslexia and, and more. So I want to be a bit provocative today. I also want to be a really thoughtful in the, in the sense that I want you to walk away going, I know what I need to do. I, I know what I can do to make one step towards change. Um, with that being said, we are humans. And did you know that humans are highly programmed? And 95% of what you think, do, say every day is one big reiteration of the day before. So to make change, it's a big deal. And I take that seriously. Uh, so this talk will hopefully inspire you to consider what it will take to make some changes in early identification. So handouts, as you can see up there in the top circle, it's called the deep dive. In that deep dive, I have included two infographics that I think are valuable that I hope for you to be able to use in dialogues that you're having for referral meetings, MTSS meetings, um, whatever you're calling those intervention process meetings. Um, and in that, you will find hyperlinks to podcasts, to webinars, to PDFs, everything that I have. Um, that I will mention today will be hyperlinked in that document. So that's really your live interactive document. And it's called the deep dive because sitting with me for one hour is not going to exactly change your world or, or maybe it will, but I hope it will. But really what happens is that we have to study this and we have to deeply learn what this is all about for us to transfer this information into practice. So that deep dive is for you to go listen to some great podcasts by the greats who taught me. Um, a lot of people are mentors in our lives and there are people that I would consider mentors in those podcasts and they're there to teach us all. So please go jump into that and then the PowerPoint will be there. So ultimately my goal of today is that um, I want us to think about the reality of early identification is that we actually have to build systems um, that support um, systems and having our teachers that are extremely knowledgeable that we get our first instruction right. And to do this, we need systems and screening tools that inform diagnostic perspectives prescriptive instruction. And if you, since you've been in Jennifer's community for a long time, or if you're brand new, what this really means is knowing exactly what you need to teach and when to teach it and what these students in each group that we have really need uh, from us as teachers and when to deliver it with efficiency um, and then how much rehearsal children will need. But without systems, assessment is nothing. Without systems, assessment is nothing. So if you don't have great systems for evidence-based instruction uh, at tier one core instruction, that's going to catch 80% of your students and then tier two instruction, tier three instruction that provide the intensified instruction needed for those who will be who will be found in your risk indication system. That's why we have risk indication systems. So we do something about it. But if the systems don't work and the interventions aren't in place and the science isn't being used and the teachers don't have the knowledge, we can't do a thing about it. As Tracy Whedon taught me recently, she's the director of the Nyhouse Center, that as leaders out there, if you're a leader, one of the greatest things we can do is A, get our systems uh, figured out and get them rocking and rolling so our teachers can function at the highest level and invest in our teacher talent so they know how to do the work. So thank you for being here if you're a leader and you just heard that. And, and teachers, if you're out there, this is your talent. Your talent is understanding what this data says and what to do when your students need you to do something. So that's our goal. But now let's just get rolling with the content. So learning to read is an absolute process. It doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't um, happen just in kindergarten, first grade. It's a process. And Jean Shaw talks about this in Stages of Reading Development, a book that was written in 1983, um, that it requires a mastering of a series of developmental stages in a response to an environmental input. 
You are the environment. You are providing the experience for that student to go through and develop their reading brain, okay? So we start with language processing early on in utero and we end with proficient reading years later, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this and chat box uh, and Jennifer is watching it, but when do children start the process of learning to read? Just start dumping that into the chat box and we can talk about it later. When do you think children start to learn to read? I think this is really important to think about. I promise you, I did not understand this maybe even five years ago. Um, I bumped into Patricia Cool out in Washington, uh, Marianne Wolf over, she's over in California now, but used to be over at Tufts, uh, and just did a lot of digging into like, well, when do, when, when do children start to learn to read? When does this process happen? Okay, so if you probably dumping it into the chat box, is it is it two? Is it is it three? Is it when they're baby? When is it right? So get your brain going, get your brain going, okay? So when we do brain dumps and we get our brain actively engaged, this is what powerful teaching is all about. We want to engage and we want to put it, it, our answers out there because we want to engage our knowledge uh, and our learning of the, with the knowledge and experientially, okay? So here it is. Obviously, it is. it starts in utero. And Jean Charles' definition right before this slide said in utero. So the baby starts to hear sounds and starts to process language while they're in utero. I think that is profound. And, and I also know through the recent work of Bruce Perry and actually Oprah Winfrey, it's Bruce Perry mostly, the work of the neuropsychologist in what happened to you when you read that book, which I think is the book of the year to read, uh, that, that not just that in utero, but that first two months of a baby's life are incredibly uh, game changing for the human life. Um, so what happens to a child in the first two months uh, with language, with interaction, with love, with relationship and everything really sets the stage for development. So the reading brain begins to develop in utero. And uh, Dr. Nadine Gab over at Harvard is doing some really amazing work with actually doing imaging studies with children as early as birth to see what the activation patterns of the brain are. And then she's now been, has followed them longitudinally through fifth grade. And what she's finding is pretty phenomenal that what they're seeing in that early uh, infant brain um, and how they're seeing some nuances that are telling them about 10 to 15% of brains are atypical in the language foundational piece of it, which leads to reading development. So that piece is so important. And um, so language, the language structures of the brain are what we build the reading brain on. And the reading brain is built, it's not born. You are born with language structures, but you build the reading brain. And that reading brain is built in one way. Yep, I said it, one way. It's a profound reality, one way. So doesn't matter if you're 84 or four, it develops in one way. So what we've learned over the years is that development of the reading brain, uh, it, it goes through these stages and we do things that are very mechanical when learning to read the word. Um, and while we were, those things include learning to decode, but that starts with learning the alphabet and how speech maps to print. Uh, we learn the sound structure of the language. That's that phonological piece. Uh, then since birth, um, uh, babies, well, from birth, I should say, babies really start to acquire knowledge of the world around them. Um, they start to develop vocabulary, saying words by uh, 12 months of age, uh, putting words together by 24 months of age, uh, starting to have verbal reasoning uh, between two and three. Uh, this knowledge just keeps building. And this is Hollis Scarborough's representation of all of the components, all of the strands that perform 
that are needed to create the proficient skilled reading brain. And in that, so we know all of this stuff. So this is very, um, what we would call settled science. It's, it's very clear that these are the things that make up the reading brain. It's very clear uh, that these are the things that we have to continue to teach across the lifespan. But what's interesting is that 34 plus 31 equals 65, right? So in 2019, the NAEP scores right before the pandemic, we, we continued to have 65% of our students not at proficient levels in reading. So um, if we know all of this information, what is it about this that we are just not getting? What is it? Um, I would you know, venture to say I, I have a few answers for that and it comes down to systems um, and they always, we fall to the level of our systems. And when our systems aren't there to support teacher knowledge and what is needed to teach students with the right assessment tools to guide, um, we don't know what we don't know. That's really the truth. We just don't know. But what we do know, what we do know is that 65% of our students in this slide, but what we go to a broader slide, um, it's sorry, I'm going to go to this one and, and pontificate a little bit more. But what we do know in a broader sense is that if our students are in specific zip codes or if they have um, if they have brown skin and they're a boy, uh, oftentimes they have higher risk. I live in a, a Montana, our native population, uh, American Indian, they have up to 85% of the students not at proficient levels. And that's just specific to my state. And so you each have your own states. Um, you each know, hopefully, your, your data. So really considering what is it uh, that's going on? And so then this comes into play. 10 to 15% of our students, the same that Nadine Gab is finding in her infant studies, uh, they have different language structures that require this very specific instruction. Um, they need explicit, systematic, diagnostic, prescriptive. This is where dyslexia falls, okay? 10 to 15% of students have these very severe word reading difficulties. But then there's another 40 to 50% of the students who learn to read um, with really code-based, explicit, systematic, sequential instruction. They need that. So when you add 15 and 50, that's 65% of the students need this type of instruction. So if... I always am like, well, maybe it's just that we're not giving the right instruction. Maybe 65% of the students are not getting this very clear, systematic, explicit, cumulative, language-based, structured literacy. Um, that, that would be part of it, yes. Um, and with that being said, there are always going to be this 40% of students over here that are going to get it. Um, and when you look back at the NAEP scores, you see that that's exactly what happens, that that 35 to 40% definitely read proficiently. So on top of those numbers across that, how many students are uh, in this these categories, I've laid out this on its side. It's uh, Nancy Young's reading ladder, but I put it on its side because I wanted to show it in comparison to the word reading continuum. So the word reading continuum is what we're really talking about in, in um, for a lot of this early identification, like where on the word reading continuum uh, of risk does a child fall? And what are the risk indication systems that happen before they're reading words? There's a few indication systems. So what we know is that we have our very highly proficient reader over here on the, the right, which is blue, uh, and well below average reader is very not proficient. And in this category, this is where dyslexia falls, significant word reading um, difficulties. But word reading's on a continuum. Um, I think that it's important to consider like autism's on a continuum. There's there's some children who have autism who have variances in their communication skills and their language processing skills and their literal language and their theory of mind and all of those different variables. And same thing with word reading. So there are some students who are really slow processors, but they're really accurate. And so they're, they're not 
they just need more time and they're going to be just fine versus a kid who who's a really slow processor and really inaccurate and has a lot of memory concerns and has a language concern and there's more of a garden variety reading disability so there's this continuum of word reading there there is no one checkbox that says oh well you can't read words you're all the same it's not the case it's a continuum they're not all the same that's what's so darn tricky about early identification is I think in our past models, I don't think I know it's it's been very binary. They have this, they don't have this, therefore then we'll do this. But where I'm taking it today is to say that we're going beyond that. It, it's much more. And that's what is important to consider. So in the US, there's always 35 to 75 percent of the students below proficient period. So consider your state, consider your district, consider your school, consider your classroom. Deeply understand what percentage of students are not proficient and know this. When they are caught early through early identification, up to 92 percent of them will normalize. Okay, 92% of them will normalize if they are caught early between four and six years of age and given the evidence-based instruction at the intensity and with the time and the teacher and the over a period of time, when they get that right intervention and they make progress, they can normalize. So then they do not go on to manifest all of the other psychosocial motivation, all these other things that can go on when we really struggle to learn to do something. So that's what's interesting. I, I'm in several schools where we have 40% of our students um, proficient. So that means 60, 65% of them aren't proficient. And I, I guarantee you the first question, are they any different from those who are excelling? No, they are not. They really aren't. It's just that we haven't figured out how to um, get our system in place so they get enough time on task. Uh, our teachers don't have all of the knowledge that they need, and we don't have the assessment tools that are helping us with reliability and validity, find the students who are at risk to provide the scientifically aligned instruction that they need. So once we get that figured out, our statistics usually flip flop. Then we go up to 80% of our students are at proficient and 20% aren't. So so it's really, it's really true. Literacy is a great equalizer. It's a, it's a tool that if you have it, you will have it forever more. So finding students early is a game changer. It will change their, total, their entire social emotional experience in school. If you struggle in reading your entire academic life, it will change your life. But if you were caught early, and the system found you and did everything possible to change the trajectory, you will forever have dyslexia. You will forever have uh, language differences or disabilities. However, when given the right instruction, you can reach proficiency and efficiency enough to be reading at grade level and know that you have the skills to do it. Okay. So I'm going to divide this out into four essential questions. And our first one is going to be, why do we screen and what do we screen for? OK, so are we talking about outcomes or are we screening for risk? I think especially leaders out there, please hear me out. Um, oftentimes we get assessment tools that are big and they do everything and they've got all the bells and whistles. And and then I go, but but did you look, did it have the actual bell and whistle for like really high reliability and validity for exactly a kindergartner? And we want to know if they have all the risk indication for dyslexia. And then you dig in and you're like, yeah, no, that one doesn't have any of that. But they have all those other bells and whistles. So I, I'm a part of a lot of decisions and uh, making teams. And we really consider who who is this assessment for? What was its purpose? And, and what is it really doing? And in this case, I'm here to tell you, we need to have the screening tools that find the risk that will tell us if students will have reading difficulties, which can be first and foremost manifested in language difficulties. And so these tools, I am going to be introducing uh, three of them or four of them I have within this PowerPoint. There are many, but the three, four that I've included have high reliability, validity, and they are uh, rarely used. However, they, they, they get the job done, okay? So 
Multiple risk factors can increase the likelihood of dyslexia. Positive factors can decrease the likelihood. So remember how I said we used to say, oh, well, if they just do this, like here in Montana, great example, passed a state law and it said, hey, we're going to we're going to screen for dyslexia. We're all going to know that if they have dyslexia or not. And the, the, the screening uh, criteria is that they're going to be screened once in phonology. That's it. No, if it was that easy, if it was that easy, this would just not be a problem in our country. We, we would have had this figured out a long time ago because we have really good screeners for phonological awareness. Um, it's not that easy. And so what the, what the great researchers like Hugh Katz have been doing in his lifetime uh, are really uh, coming to terms with the fact that it's not just this one indication system. In fact, you could have poor phonological skills, but go on to not be dyslexic. So I could have screened you in Montana and said, oh, you're dyslexic because you have poor phonological skills one time. No, you have to apply evidence-based instruction. You progress monitor over time. You do another benchmark. You, uh, you look at all of the other risk indication factors and then you rule in or out um, what we have on our hands. So we're going to talk about that. So we're going to talk about what it means to have a multiple risk factor analysis, not just a check the box, no, they don't have it, or check the box, yes, they do have it, uh, which I think a lot of our assessment tools are like, oh, we have this nice little add-on, you can just go through it and you'll know if you have dyslexia. And there's, there's uh, cumulative risk. There are, you know, I have plenty of students that I've seen, and this is a true story in a, a classroom I helped with this past year, where we had 14 students that were reading between two and I believe it was like 33 words a minute in second grade at the beginning of the year post COVID break and then coming back to school very uh, minimally. What I learned was that technically they all look like they had dyslexia according to what we were asked to do by state law. But we went beyond the law because we know that you could have dyslexia if you have a phonological impairment or not. What we have to know is you respond to instruction and you have a persistently poor response and it shows up in your reading and spelling over time. So um, we also needed to know for those who had excessive risk factors, how they responded to instruction, and those who had promotive and protective factors had better outcomes. And those things are going to be discussed in this next slide. So thankfully to uh, Hugh Katz, Yakov Petcher uh, just published uh, just uh, last week, uh, came out in the journal Learning Disabilities, uh, Cumulative Risk Model for Dyslexia. Um, and you know, other work by DeJong and Slomowitz in the group, um, really what this is saying is we, we just don't have this deterministic model that says uh, when they do a CBM and they get these scores, we know they have something. No, we know they have risk. And now we have to understand in dialogue with our colleagues how much risk a child has, okay? So that's what I want you to do. If that's the one thing you take away from this talk today, this is it. That you have numbers when you get screening. Uh, the next thing is to say, what else do we know? And here you go. These are the things to start talking about, okay? I want, um, I have to move my little visual here. Within child factors, these are genes. Um, between, I've read between 45 and 68% uh, heritability, means that if your parents have dyslexia, uh, if they have a language-based learning difference, there's this 45 to 68% chance that the child will also have it. Um, so yeah, I got some numbers on a, on a few assessments, but what if I knew that? What if I knew if mom and dad had a language-based learning difference? That would be powerful. That's one, so that's an, so I have low numbers. I have an added risk. I have some family members who also have had difficulties. Then I look at my numbers and I say, is it a phonological, a phonological working memory, a RAN? What are the cognitive deficits? And if they have more than one, uh, especially RAN and phonological, that is, uh, that's increased risk. Um, do they have language difficulties? Were they a late talker? Um, is there any other noted information we have about language? Um, 
do they follow directions that, you know, teacher bringing all this to the table? Do we have attentional concerns? Has there been attentional concerns? Uh, have there been attentional concerns? Um, what do we know about adverse environmental factors in that trauma? What do we know about that child's life? The more they have those uh, risk factors they're finding, the more um, it's like a stack uh, against that child. And that means that we have to do really assess what we're going to have to do for promotion. So promotive, protective, uh, supportive uh, things for that child. So no longer do numbers just say, oh, yay, we got a number. Yeah, they have something. We say, oh, yay, we got a number. And that's just the beginning of it all. Now let's consider all of the risk. Let's consider all of the protection. So let's look at those things. The protection factors, they build resiliency. Um, we, we just understanding that supportive family, their support in, in general, peer support, children. Fumiko Haft has a great podcast on your deep dive uh, where she really talks about through COVID and, and other things that they're doing to really figure out the social emotional networking effect with children who have differences and when they have great peer support versus being in an environment where they're actually called stupid, dummy, really blatant names because they struggle when they read. And, and children, they're, they're kids. And sometimes they say really crazy mean things and I've seen it and um, I get it. And I have thought so long and hard about what are the ramifications over time of being in a classroom where your peer support isn't there. Um, and what if you were in a school where more students uh, had had similar struggles and you worked through it together. So um, I, I played with that this year in a competency model um, experience and that classroom flourished, flourished. And four of them went on to be identified with SLD, but the types of relationships that were built in that classroom over the course of the year will uh, be bonds that will last forever. I'm, I'm certain of it uh, because they had a peer support group and that was profound. Uh, so, this is what we're talking about early identification, uh, really also down to that birth to three, uh, part B and part C of the IDEA law. Uh, finding kids even in child find, uh, knowing early on that we have students with language skill. If you have great language skill, if you have task-focused behavior, if you have average intelligence, if you have typical uh, if, adaptive, excuse me, coping strategies, uh, if you have had great instruction, um, if you have RAN, rapid automatic naming, that's a processing thing. If you have it within normal limits, these are all things that are going to protect you, okay? really important to consider these things. And we want to make sure that we understand this and take our numbers and do something that does what Bruce Pennington says up in the top, the causes. So these risk things, the things that happen to children are no longer considered deterministic. So it's not about their family. It's not about their zip code. It's not about their genetics. It's not about any of that. That does not determine what will happen to a child, you determine that. You as a system, as a grade level team, as a teacher, you change children's lives. So please do not ever think you can't do something about it, especially when they're between four and eight. Okay, so now I'm gonna to give you some definitions here because understanding dyslexia, uh, this is important because when we do screening for risk, we have a lot of state laws in place and across the country, and they're really looking for us to find students who have this risk because there's a lot of evidence that say that says exactly what I've said before. If we find them early, we, we apply great evidence-based instruction. Uh, we can normalize children and help them move on to a trajectory that is, is way different than if we don't find them and wait and fail and or are identified as late uh, developing dyslexia in second grade or something. So bottom line is, is that most researchers and clinicians and educators agree that primary, the primary characteristic of dyslexia is that 
It's a severe and persistent difficulty learning to read and spell words despite adequate opportunity and instruction. And there is also an agreement that children must have adequate vision and hearing acuity, whereas the adequacy of verbal and nonverbal intellectual abilities is still under debate. I appreciate that that was all there. I think that the researchers are continuously pressing forward to to reshape the definition so it becomes useful, even more useful over time for us as educators. But really, dyslexia has to, it's manifest when we see the severe, persistent difficulty with learning to read and spell. So what do early indication systems do? They tell us about risk for developing dyslexia, that persistent difficulty of learning to read and spell words over time. And so if we catch that risk and apply the instruction, we won't see these severe and persistent difficulties. Okay, that's the goal. The next uh, major area, so this is like specific learning disabilities, like the number one area is reading, uh, word reading difficulties, okay? So a high percentage of our students up to uh, some st studies that 20% have dyslexia in a classroom. The other one is um, developmental language um, disorder, okay, DLD. So this one is very prevalent, less talked about, uh, less understood in the screening research, but by golly, remember that study that I talked about with Nadine Gab at research? Like she's looking at infants and finding that the, the language structures of the infant brain, uh, 10 to 15% of them are different. Um, and so that may manifest in developmental language disorders. There's other substantial amounts of evidence that show that children who have uh, early identified language differences when they get intervention early, game changer. I've been a part of these studies and um, they're just different children. The children who get the early language intervention from birth to five versus those who don't. It's, it's a different ballgame. So what DLD is, is that it's a brain difference uh, that makes talking and listening difficult. If you remember, dyslexia was defined by persistent uh, lack of response to learning to read and spell words. This is about uh, brain difference that makes talking and listening difficult. So this is language, okay, talking and listening. It's associated with risk for dyslexia. So yeah, right. If you don't have language, it can be difficult to learn to read. DLD poses risk for social emotional behavioral concerns. Um, it has five times more prevalent than autism. So it's extremely prevalent in your classrooms. It affects about two children out of every classroom. Interesting, this is from DLD and me, also on your deep dive, that um, they didn't say the classroom size. I'm, when I look at statistics, I think it's a classroom of 20. So the similarities and differences between dyslexia and DLD, um, I'm going through these because you have to understand why you're doing this. Why are you screening? Oh, these are the top two uh, differences and disabilities you are looking for. You are trying to screen these things out so you can provide the best instruction. And for leadership, you're going to close gaps if you understand who these groups of students are because they're very prevalent in our classrooms. So they both last a lifetime. They're not going away. There are no cures. Both are prevalent in every classroom, 5 to 20 percent. Of those that have dyslexia, 30 percent have DLD, comorbid. That means they have both. That's, that's, that's big. Uh, 50 percent in the clinical population. So of those who go on into clinical um, samples, meaning they go to get assessed to see if they have dyslexia, they also get assessed for language, and they find that 50 percent of the students that end up going on for those advanced evaluations 50% of them have both DLD and dyslexia. So it's uh, the greatest allies in schools are informed teachers and systems. Uh, that's where we come in. We are allies to these students. We are there to understand these differences so we can change their lives and identify what needs to be identified and get the instruction in place. Both respond to explicit, systematic, cumulative reading instruction based in the structure of the English language, also known as structured literacy. Um, and DLD students typically need more language supports, usually supported by speech language pathologist. 
People with DLD have trouble understanding and using language. Okay, they have trouble understanding and using language when they are reading and when they are talking. This is not the case for those with dyslexia alone. If you have dyslexia, you're struggling with reading and writing, but typically oral language and talking and processing is fine. But DLD kids have the oral language processing and talking and understanding. Plus, if they have dyslexia, then it's hard to learn to read. So now if I can't read and I can't process what I'm reading, boom, significant reading problems, okay? So what are we gonna do about this? So screening for them. We're really screening uh, for risk indication so we can do something. That's just the bottom line. If we don't use our screening tools, then we might as well not do them. And if you're doing them because somebody required you to do them, then please understand what they're being used for and really get after how you can use that data for your uh, student's benefit and your benefit. You are there to change lives. So this is about helping you do that. Um, you know, in dyslexia, I think it's really important to understand for educational purposes. If a student is struggling in the process of learning to read, there's a risk of dyslexia. So if it's, if you have a student that's just struggling in the whole process of learning to read, from learning the alphabet to the sounds to phonological awareness, um, then that's pretty clear that that might be dyslexic. But but it's not just one thing. So you know this is what we're talking about for DLD. Focusing on language development takes away some of the mystery for educators. So for dyslexia, we focus on reading development and. Any child struggling learning to read, we could say, let's just call them all word reading difficulties, dyslexic or not. They have word reading difficulties. I promise you, you have plenty of children who could be called dyslexic. Um, you may just be calling them students with word reading difficulties and they're on the continuum. There are severe ones, they're not so severe, and there are those who are just average. Then there are those who have language continuum difficulties. Um, so understanding that, wow, they learn to read, but they really don't process and they're not comprehending and they can't answer the comprehension questions more to do with language. They are, can be comorbid. We just talked about that. Um, so basically early intervention can change the game for both of them. So that's why this risk indication system is just so important and really understanding what those risks are. I made this slide for you today because I wanted to really get after something that it's kind of hard to get after, but I, I pulled this quote out of the Katz and Petra article and it says research shows that development of accurate and fluent word reading so that word reading continuum. The development of that word reading skill relies on a host of linguistic cognitive socio socio-emotional, orthographic, and instructional factors that act and interact in various ways. That comes from Kate Kane, a group of Kate Kane's work, it's the LARC. And as such, difficulties in learning to read are likely due to individual difference in experiences across many of the factors. So sure, I get this like marker in phonology, but you know, I'm gonna look at this. So linguistic skills, that's where phonology lies. So I have a test period one, test period two, test period three. And I took the skills that Kate Kane talked about, linguistic skills. We all kind of had, you know, they were here. And then over the course of progress monitoring, they got better. And then all of a sudden at benchmarking too, boom, their phonological skills dropped there. Um, so that'd be phoneme segmentation fluency or initial sound fluency or just overall response to something happened. And um, interestingly, uh, I am going to see that their cognitive skills were, um, they're just stable. That's pretty typical. Cognitive skills are stable. Uh, but this kid after that, maybe it was just a bad testing time because um, it looks like their social emotional was coming back up, but took a dip after that. And uh, then their, their linguistic skills went back up and their, um, their orthographic skills were going down. Um, and so these are all on continuums. So what's happening within each continuum, it tells us more about the risks a student has stacked against them. So I, I just noticed I didn't label the blue line, I apologize. 
Um, but the point of this is, is to say there's a continuum and at each benchmarking period, you're looking at how are, you know, what's going on social emotionally, what's, uh, what are their orthographic skills doing, what are their other linguistic skills doing, that could be language, um, listening to directions or phonological skills. Um, their cognitive skills, what's their RAN score, that's a processing. Um, so we can look at things like that. So these are things that we have to continuously intake information for because it informs our overall um, knowledge of what's happening. So recapping uh, essential question one, why do we screen? Um, we're really looking for screening of risk. We're not looking for are they going to do fine on the state assessment? Are they uh, going to pass third grade? Are they um, going to be able to read at the end of second grade? No, uh, you can, prediction assessments can tell you that, but we really need to figure out if they have risk of, and if their reading brain is building, getting built appropriately and efficiently. So that's what that really means. The second question, question is what systems do we need and what statistics do we need? I'm gonna quickly go through this one. The bottom line is, as I said it before, we fall to the level of our system. So if we don't have good systems in place that provide the instruction necessary, um, our, our screening will be for naught. Uh, so we have to have our systems review them. We have to have that MTSS, uh, RTI, universal screening. Uh, then you have to dig deeper with deeper diagnostics or survey screening. Uh, we have to understand and plan for student grouping. Um, then we move into what we call structured literacy, this more evidence-based uh, scientifically aligned instruction. We, we measure response, we progress monitor, we adapt, and we monitor growth rates. And we change groupings, we change targets if we need to. Our assessments have to have this 0.8 or better for reliability, validity, sensitivity, and specificity. That's a whole nother talk. However, I'm going to give you a di a diag, um, sorry, a, a, um, a link on the deep dive that you can go and read about how to evaluate screening tools by Yakov Petcher. It's a great guidance tool. And I also give you a link on how to evaluate your curriculums to ensure that they are scientifically aligned and or look at ones that are. Why do we use assessment to inform instruction? Um, oh, I clearly have a uh, miswritten uh, uh, heading there. Um, good instruction will, uh, will also inform us is the point. Uh, you can use great assessment tools and we all need them and I'm an advocate, I think they're amazing. But what I do know is that if I just go into a classroom and teach with structured literacy and I understand how the reading to brain is developed and I take this speech system and map it to print and I see how a student is not making sense of this, this phonological system and how it maps to the orthographic system. I'm getting a lot of information there and that feedback is telling me there seems to be a lot of risk moving into how the student is learning to read. Hmm, might be dyslexia. Um, but if I see that the student's doing okay, but not processing directions and doesn't learn vocabulary, it might be like, hmm, seems like a language thing's going on. If I'm an informed teacher, I also understand risk. So in the hands of skilled structured literacy teachers, well taken data supports unbiased, timely educational decision making and thereby improve student outcomes. That's your goal, okay? You wanna have unbiased. So I have opinion and bias, but when I take this data and I see what their phonological skills are, what their orthographic skills are, what their vocabulary skills are, boom, it's a game changer. Then I know and I group better and I, and I do better with my instruction. Here's the guiding questions for, um, from Yakov Petcher. I'm not gonna perseverate on this. These are, uh, the point is, is that there is something there. And if you've questioned your tool, the number one thing we have to question is how is the population defined in that sampling? There are tools out there that flat out say, this screening tool was not, is not meant for struggling readers. Many people use that assessment tool. It blows my mind. It was never built for struggling readers. Um, if you wanna know, you can write me a personal email, but the bigger picture of assessment tools is, is that I want you to go in and read about it. it. You know, what were they created for? Were they created to predict large outcome measures for state assessments? Well, if I'm a kindergartner, that's not what I'm doing. I'm building my reading brain in kindergarten. 
I need an assessment that is, is going to give me risk indication for that level um, and what it does. So uh, when was it, was it normed on your population? Oftentimes when I'm working on reservations, I always look into the sample. When I lived in Bush, Alaska for years, I did the same thing um, because the language dialect variation, everything was so different that I really had to consider if that test was even appropriate for the students I was giving it to. Um, then uh, what types of reliability are reported? There's great uh, websites out there, especially uh, for looking at the, the center for um, the effective, they're looking at assessments and they're saying, you know, these are these assessments are re meeting these rubrics, but I still encourage you to go in and look, do they have these numbers? If they're curriculum-based measurement CBMs, they have to have a 0.8. If they are a diagnostic clinical tool, it has to have a 0.9. That's like a Woodcock Johnson. It's like a 0.91 or a clinic self, a clinical evaluation of language fundamentals. But if you're a computer adaptive assessment, like if you had a STAR or FastBridge or uh, iReady, iSIP, all these ones out there, go look at the reliabilities. And if they're really sensitive for finding the kids early, four to eight, who need to be found? Um, I do that all the time. And I end up finding out that the, if you're building a system that's K-12, it wasn't exactly built to find those, those discrete skills early on. And I really pull out the numbers. It's very, very important, okay? So basically, what systems do you need? Those systems, MTS, with solid uh, structured literacy that's informed by data to drive the small grouping with progress monitoring, mastery measurement monitoring, and flexible grouping to see our students make progress and hopefully by second grade normalize and not be in the risk categories anymore. Okay. So the third question, you know, if 92% of our students in K-1 classrooms uh, with the resources and knowledge based in science of reading, how do we find the students? Okay, so if we can normalize them, how do we find them? Um, so we got to consider the processes that could create for for proficient reading. That means you got to know what the processes are. That means you got to know what the underlying skills are that predict reading. So here we go. So frameworks help us organize our thinking. So I'm going to do this in light of the simple view of reading. Most of you have heard of the simple view, or at least I hope you have. Um, decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. With this being said, I'm just gonna bring them up. Those are some things that we typically assess in uh, tools. We say, hey, those are the decoding skills. These are some of the language skills. Um, and then there are other things that we like to look at. And you know, do they have that adverse experience? Do they have heritability? Uh, what were their social skills? What is their RAND score? What's their task-focused behavior? I start to look at other things and I really like this is called the mixer knob, uh, you know, which, what are they? And the orange line is just average. So like they have below average phonological skills, below average word reading, below average spelling. Wow, but everything else is pretty okay. I might have risk indication for dyslexia on my hands because dyslexia was students who had persistently poor response in learning to read and spell. So, um, but their language was good. Remember language DLD had to do with students who had expressive and receptive language difficulties. So that's good. I like to go through these and I like to figure out what are the underlying processes I need to understand to figure out what students need. And our CBMs and our CATs, which are the curriculum based measurements and computer adaptive testing, which I'm sure many of you have out there. Um, they're not all inclusive of language. So these are the screenings that we've had for a long time. And uh, they don't have that sensitivity and specificity. They, they're uh, over identifying too many false positives saying these, all these kids have problems or they're under identifying and they're saying not enough children have difficulties in kindergarten. And what our CBMs are, are these Phillips screwdrivers or flat screwdrivers and they're saying, We've done just this one thing. We found that this one skill has uh, is below benchmark. And then that's when I say, now what else do you know? Um, so taken together, we can get a lot of information, um, but 
you know, both of them have reasons, you know, to dig deep and really understand what they have within them. But here's where screening potential is going. We're looking at the risk resilience model. We're building these evidence-based systems that support the screening. The screening shouldn't just be done because we have a law. It should be done because it's part of an entire system that supports kids. They're getting more precise. They're finding kids with more precision with these, they're looking at these processes, linguistic and cognitive, and pre-reading language and cognitive, and we're looking at family history. So basically the mixer knobs, you know, when you consider essential question three, like if we can normalize them, like what do I need to know? I kind of need to know about these reading skills, these language skills, these other skills, the whole model. So the last question, let's look at some um, tools out there. So there's a simple view of reading and here's some tools. This one's a CBM. I just pulled in a cadence reading um, and here they are. So we teach these things to teach word reading, the pink and the orange, uh, are the things that we teach to build word reading skill. Um, and then we have language comprehension to get to, multiplied by language to get to reading, right? And so we measure these things. Those indicators are ran all the way down to reading comp maze. And on the cadence, I put the comprehension fluency in oral language is called the CFOL survey as a blue a piece right here because that's a survey, it's not a prediction tool, uh, but everything else here, the initial sound all the way to reading comp maze, those, those have prediction power. They're telling you something about, um, you know, the reading composite in a cadence is as powerful as a 0.85 to a state outcome measure, depending on the state. Very one, one to three minute probes, give you high prediction to a different uh, reading outcome with very Phillips screwdriver, like boom, can this kid read? And it predicts something else that's really powerful. Um, and so these have that reliability and validity, those numbers that I discussed in evaluating the tools. And they also have this rapid automatic naming piece. And remember in the risk indication, if you don't have good RAN, that's a risk indication. So we kind of want to know that. And not a lot of tools have that RAN right now. So this is one of them, uh, the reason I brought it in here, because it also has a survey for comprehension, fluency, and oral language. Not all assessments include language. So I'm only showing you uh, tools that, that assess both the decoding side and the language side of the reading process to predict reading these first two. Okay, so the next one, so these are tools that help you understand how to drive your instruction with reliability and validity. And the next one is called Early Bird. It's just out on the market. I had the pleasure of helping in this study in, with 40 some kids in Montana uh, in the validation study. And this is for kindergarten right now. It's, it's an iPad app. It takes 20 to 25 minutes um, and students go through and play a gamified uh, assessment with this little penguin or a toucan named Pip. And in that process, they, we get to know a lot about their phonological processing skills, their um, early learning of the alphabet system, what their risk for a potential for word reading, their risk for dyslexia, and we also rule out all of the language pieces through this um, gamified app. It's the potential is uh, amazing to understand what you have on your hands when you get this data back is extremely exciting and, and I'm going to show you that right now. So, you know, this is a great example. All of us have had exposure to leveled experiences um, and it's you know basically an assessment that's asking you to do the assessment to find a level for a student and that's pretty much all we know just that they're a level so these are two students in kindergarten who were at a level b2 where new assessments are taking us and what we're deeply understanding in the early bird assessment is that we know so much more when we dig into all of the pre-reading skills and decoding, all of the language skills, 
We didn't have that information before. So look at what that looks like. So these two students both had the same leveled book. However, when you really dug in, were they the same? And dark blue is high risk, uh, light blue is some risk. And uh, what you'll see is that these students had entirely different risk patterns. We have a student over here, Samantha. She had risk with letter name, letter sound, and RAN. She has this lower RAN score. There's ding, 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 risk. So RAN plus uh, potential other things can lead to uh, exacerbated risk or compounded risk. But this student over here has high RAN, 74th percentile, uh, great letter name sound. Um, what they're struggling, what this little guy Jason's struggling with is he's He's struggling with just blending and an actual phonological memory tasks, uh, but decent vocabulary. This kiddo over here has strong vocabulary. So while she doesn't have the RAN and this letter sound correspondence, she's probably making up for it with her knowledge of words. And so she's able to predict and guess and do things like that. So this student over here is able to pull the nose the letter is able to apply the sound is able to blend and decode a little bit more um, but then needs a lot more phonological development so they need two different things uh, and and also probably controlled readers uh, there's also one more student in this kindergarten example that is really important it's a student who maybe get play, gets placed very high and they're considered a good reader. Um, and what we find is that while their vocabulary is off the charts, there is risk for this student and so maybe this student is really finding that they're looking at the pictures they have a lot of background knowledge they got great vocabulary they're able to make a lot of guessing happen uh, with that first sound and they they uh, they they're able to fill in things but they really aren't uh, getting uh, this phonological piece of their reading brain is not developed and it's not contributing to the reading process. So this student, while they look like they're doing amazing things and reading high level books, really needs to be taught in phonological skill in small group. So another assessment I'm gonna give a shout out to is assessment of literacy and language, one you probably haven't heard a lot about. Uh, this one is for children in kindergarten and uh, pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade, uh, who exhibit language concerns, risk for later reading, uh, including dys dyslexia, disabilities and dyslexia. So we have now the Acadians protocol, we have the early bird protocol, we have the all protocol. Um, and the last one I'm going to add to this for time's sake is the apprise. This one is not, um, so back to the all, this one's published purchasable, this one's published purchasable, Acadians free and purchasable. Um, all great. I'm not just saying these are the only ones. I'm not paid by anybody, believe me. I am showing you what I know to work because I have been doing my homework and I work with real teachers and we want to find risk as soon as possible. And we want, we do not want children to struggle into second grade. We want to get this risk indicated in preschool if we can. So please know that these are just tools out there that can help you build a, a richer, stronger toolkit for assessment. This one is in development. It's going to be a free app and it will be supplemental add-on screener. It's uh, powerful. It's uh, being created by Nadine. I'm sorry, this one is Fumiko Heft up in uh, Yukon. And she is looking at the cognitive executive functioning skills like response time, working memory, processing speed, nonverbal IQ. Uh, of course, four to eight, all of these have the four to eight um, uh, uh, age bracket. The, the goal is really, we want to find risk before we have any struggle. We, we, we want to know before they start failing. There's just no reason for this failure. There's no reason for 65% of our students not getting to proficiency, okay? So there are incredible tools on, the, on either the forefront that are about in our hands or they're, they're there. We can, we can have them. So are screeners all we use? No. Okay, we don't just go, let me screen and that's it. I did my work. No, we go on and we pull out that teeter totter of risk. We look at all of that cumulative risk and protective factors. We look at survey um, knowledge. We look at response to instruction, progress monitoring, mastery measurement. All of that stuff gets taken into account. So 
final recap, uh, what are some examples of early screening tools? Um, I'd love for you just to dump in. I know Jennifer's watching the chat. What are other tools you're using? I'd love to know. I'm, you know, there's everything I mentioned before. There's just so many tools out there. Some of them are multipliers. Some of them are Phillips screwdrivers. The real deal is that you understand if they're finding the risk and just doing what they need to do so you can get the students normalized up to 95% of children can read at basic skill level uh, by the end of you know second grade is what I like to see. So, uh, but that's just a reality. 95% of all students can read at basic skill levels. So we wanna get there. So just give a shout out in the chat box. Jennifer will let me know uh, when we come back on in a second. What will you do to change early identification in your classroom, in your school, in your district? If you're a leader, if you are a teacher leader, if you are a coach, if you are a tutor, if you're a parent, you know, just advocate with this knowledge that we know better so we can do better. The deal is, is that I follow a lot of really great um, social psychologists, organizational psychologists, of whom two of them are. Adam Grant and Brene Brown. And one of the things I'm deeply learning right now is that when we are surrounded by environments and systems that are familiar, we tend to do what we have always done. And I think I kind of provided a provocative picture that there is, there is other stuff out there. Um, and we can find these kids early and it will be so exciting. And we need to also educate ourselves on how to do that. Because even when taught to rethink our questions, and or a rethink or question our answers, humans tend to stick with what they're comfortable with. So I'm challenging that, okay? I started this off by saying this is gonna take work um, to get us into a new era of how we screen. We will close the gap. We will change the paradigm that says, we have to wait and they'll fail. And then, oh, that's dyslexia. Uh-uh, let's not wait, nuh-uh. We can find the risk, we can do what we need to do and intervene early and change that child's life forevermore. So this is about getting it right, not being, not being right. So if you think, well, I'm right, I did this forever and I really think this is a great system, challenge yourself. See what else is out there, see how much more you can do, see how many more children you can find. There are the references, they're all there. Um, the deep dive, there's a, a link to the Big Sky Summit. Come hang out with us in Montana. If you can get here, we'd love to have you. We have a few seats left. It's a live conference, okay? And thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, I will make sure you get the slides and the teeter-totter of risk for uh, data dialogue discussions, okay? All right. That was awesome, as usual. Great job. <laughs> I'll let you have a little drink there while I queue up some of your questions. So just kind of, you know, going back to the beginning, um, a lot of people were kind of worried about, you know, these kids that are premature or come from low socioeconomic backgrounds. I'm, they want to make sure you're saying that they're not, that you're not saying they can't catch up and how do you catch them up? Mm -hmm. I think hopefully you took away that uh, language development starts in utero and reality is, is that if the research is conclusively showing behaviorally, which means when we are able to interact with the child and do assessments because they're, they're in front of us, that's behavioral data um, versus on their, their brain, that's a neuroimaging data. There, if we know that they have these differences early on, why aren't we doing early intervention? Here's the deal. I live in Montana. My state is one of four that doesn't fund preschool. So children do not have to come to school until they're seven. Do you know when the brain's most malleable window of experience of teaching and exposure and learning is? It's before seven. It's through six years of age. So what I'm saying is get in there as soon as possible and change children's lives. These right. risk indication systems are provocative that it, it don't wait, don't even wait till they're three, but we don't have all those risk indication systems from birth to three, but they're starting at three. Um, and that the ultimate goal I, I hear uh, when I listen to Nadine Gab is to have a iPad in a pediatrician's office where the child just plays with this little game. And then the pediatrician's like, wow, we have risk for dyslexia. We have risk for developmental languages. So they're going to have early risk indication and early intervention and closure of gaps sooner is 
ultimately the goal. Well, yes, I think that is ultimately the goal, but I think what, what the questions really are is, well, should they switch to teaching preschool or can, you know, can they close some gaps, you know, where they are, you know, and, yeah. um, and so I think that, I mean, we, we, we know if kids had better nutrition, if they had access to healthcare, I mean, you can predict reading failure by whether there's a dentist in the neighborhood of the kids. I mean, there's not, we know we have these predictors, um, but I can't fund a dentist and, um, you know, or provide them with healthcare, but, you know, how much can these teachers close these gaps, you know, at these upper grades? But I think what you're saying is yeah. you can't. I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm hearing you now. And, and just to let you know, I worked in Bush, Alaska for eight years. And through COVID, I had this unique experience. And Fumiko Haif talked about it in her podcast on your deep dive that there are some children who don't even have technology in their, their homes. And so once the pandemic hit, there was no way of reaching children. And that, that where your zip code, uh, where you live, uh, it really can impact you and, um, and your opportunities. So, but what I am here to say, and also knowing that I have been a teacher in those environments is when children are in our care, we can do a lot to close those gaps. Ultimately, um, I would love to have a pulpit and I always will speak at <laughs> legislature and everything I have and I do, I lobby right. if I can. Yeah. For early um, education, the more we fund that early uh, birth to five window and get the dentists, get the support, the, the child right. care, the whatever we need, I'm going to support it all the way. So yeah, I, if absolutely you're a teacher, do. I, just, want, I just didn't want our older teachers to lose hope because you know what, yeah. what you're saying is if you can look at what is impacting them the most, and sometimes, you know, it's um, when you were looking at your differentials for different, you know, prerequisite skills, you can, you may not be able to close the gap as, as, you know, closed, closed as you'd like, um, depending on their age, but we can move our kids, even if we have them for a short time, if we can target, and I think that's what you're saying is that targeting the deficits are going to make us more productive and, and kind of close those gaps. So, so, so two, two quick stories, the, the group of 14 kids in second grade that I mentioned earlier, um, we had a thousand percent gain scores in that classroom. So they were the most impacted group of second graders I had seen in a long time. There is, they come, the, the zip code, everything that we're talking about, the dentist, all of that stuff is this group of children's life. And the, the gain that we saw because we applied, we had the right data, we used structured literacy, we had three hour ELA block, right. we were not messing around. And then I have yeah. another uh, colleague who took on high school kids, nine through 12. Also, mm -hmm. the most growth they had seen with a group of children because they applied the right knowledge and, and really did progress monitoring. And the amount of knowledge we have to have about who that human is and how much they've gone through and struggle by the time they're a ninth grader, it, it, that's profound too. And I have deep yes. respect for uh, my colleagues who teach older students, but they, the gap closures just heard about it last night. It's, it's true. Well, I picked those questions first because I started my career in high school kids with behavior disorders, you know, and they, everyone had given up on them. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's, it's never too late you yeah. know, to, to make yeah. a significant difference. So I'm, I'm so excited that people are asking these questions. There were some terminology questions that I think um, might be important to address. A lot of people were asking about RAN. So wouldn't yeah. mind if you, they asked a lot about what is it? And then I think some Googled and then they want to know how to, what, what measure yeah. you prefer. So you could so, hit both of those. <laughs> you know, quickly rapid automatic naming. Um, we usually do object naming, color naming. Uh, you can do numeric or alphabetic. Uh, what they're doing is they're looking at a sheet of colors that are in squares or uh, objects like this is a car, this is a star, this is a house. And they quickly go star, star, house, car, car. No, you know, they have to know the vocabulary. You have to test them on the vocabulary to know what we're testing is how quickly they retrieve the information, rapid automatic naming. Because when they read, they're looking at print and they have to rapidly retrieve information and apply that sound. And that processing of information, if it's really slow and retrieval is really delayed, we have a problem. Um, and so rapid automatic naming. And so you'll find um, 
assessments that have those, the ones that were on um, that I brought into play, all of those have ran now. Not all of your tools out there do. So check for that. It adds a lot to the prediction if you understand RAN. And then on, in terms of a diagnostic, the CTOP, there's one in the KTEA, um, and then um, some psych tests also, like I think the WIDE or the WISC also. So those are just some to name a few. Yeah, and if you, if you have um, some of the free screeners give you not normed RAN, but you'd be able to see um, compared to your class, which is really all you're usually worried about, right, is, is who's the low one in your class. Um, mm -hmm. You could probably, you know, do like the Mississippi screen or something like that it has some RAM that's free. Do you ever recommend those like for the teachers to get started before they yeah, commit to absolutely. buying a $1,000 test? <laughs> oh, yeah, gosh, no. I mean, hopefully you can even just like we just got into a cadence because the everything was printable and free. And we just used all of those last year and it really helped people see like, whoa, this, this student does not retrieve information. And so right. that was really helpful for all of the teachers to do it and see what that processing looked like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, and it's so good because what you were talking about is, you know, that those language deficits, sometimes those kids just can't go in and get it. Like it's in there, but you don't have all day to wait for it, you know? And so you have to come up with different ways, right? So. So once you can, once you know these things, I'm so happy you're talking about them all, then you start to see how they manifest in your classroom. And so when you test them, they, you're going, oh yeah, that's what I figured, right? So you start to see how these things work together. So I'm, I just, oh my gosh, I just love this presentation. Okay. Um, so then we have some people who are asking about um, what MTSS is. And I'll be honest, a lot of people don't know that term that I talked to all over the country. So if you wouldn't mind explaining yeah. that. Yeah, so I use the terminology based in the IDEA 2004 uh, reauthorization, which is multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, different states have renamed it um, and multi-tiered systems of support and that can be behavioral and academic, um, it, math, reading and behavior. Uh, and so what we're talking about is the multi-tiered system meaning that we have this core uh, we teach with our core programming. We meet 80% of our students' needs with our core reading block, which is usually 90 to 120 minutes long. And for those students who need additional um, intervention, they need intensified instruction, they get that core plus uh, 30 minutes. And then for those who are, who are needing even more, it's core plus 60 minutes. And then these students who get core plus 60 either go on to be persistently poor responders and identified as uh, SLD reading or SLD writing, SLD math, um, or and or language disabilities, um, behavioral. So whatever uh, the um, interventions are for, obviously that tier three is where we really start to see um, if they're persistently poor responders and would benefit from in supports throughout their academic experience. Hopefully that helps. And, no, that is really good because we had a, in Georgia, we had student support team and that MTSS replaced that um, as a terminology and everyone's confused. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, people just like to change acronyms every once in a while just to keep us on our toes. <laughs> Yeah, and MTSS um, and RTI, response to instruction, um, are children responding to your instruction? And you should be monitoring typical children every four weeks. That means if they're benchmark kids that are just, ah, you know, good, you know, their data looks great. There's no risk, there's not a lot of risk. Um, but if they're at risk, we measure them every two. If they're really at risk, we measure them every week uh, just to understand if they're progressing. And if our instruction, if they're responding to it, because if they're not responding to our instruction, what are we doing? Right. But people sometimes think that when we assess, we have to use a giant assessment every week. But we're, you're talking about it could be a curriculum based measurement. It could be like all different things. A right. mastery measurement of exactly what you're trying to, what you're teaching. Right. Um, are they mastering the content? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because sometimes I know teachers get a little worked up when they think, oh my gosh, I have 30 kids. I've got to test every single one of them, you know, every week. How am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. So um, totally get it. Um, that's so funny because someone just asked that. Um, and it's someone I've trained. So Joe, we're talking about this because you should know the answer to that. Um, but anyway, so, <laughs> so um, the, the other thing that people were asking about is 
Um, you mentioned Bruce Perry. I didn't get to read your references. Is the, his book in there? Because um, actually, no. Let me. Make, it's called "What Happened to You" by Bruce Perry. What happened to you by Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey? Really, probably the best. Oprah read. Winfrey. I've heard of her. I, I know. I think maybe you have. <laughs> So Bruce Perry is a neuropsychologist who she called on her show repeatedly, who taught her a lot about how adverse experiences in children's lives really play out in ways that we as educators have yet to deeply understand. And in this book, I say that because it, he kind of schooled me in this book, and I've been working with trauma-informed care for a while, right. and um, it's worth I need to read it like three times and maybe go meet Bruce. Perry. Everything. I read everything three times. Um, yeah, you need it to. on audiobook, listen yep. to it in the car and then listen to it again and then read the book. It's like, we think kids, kids need multiple repetitions. How are we supposed to pick out all these great gems? I mean, honestly, people watch her presentation that she just did tonight when it goes to the YouTube channel over and over and over again, because I'm, I'm telling you, I think you're going to pick up, um, a little something new and better each time you go through it because right. this was so good. I'm so grateful that you um, came on and did this. Okay, so um, when you are, you know, have kids that if we're talking about early intervention, do you have different screeners? What people are based, a lot of people are asking, like for pre-K, K, K and one, K and above, is there anything that you could name that you think would be the best for K through eight or <laughs> well uh, is that is over and over again I think people are thinking I gotta buy one thing to get started yeah is one thing one to get started or... mm -hmm. um just know that a cadence reading has always allowed their dibbles a seventh edition to be a free and accessible download yes you pay for printing cost um, I have always been grateful for that. It came out of uh, research long time ago, 40 some odd years of research right now in the CBMs uh, with the University of Oregon, Roland Good. And sometimes I just need a tool and I pull those off because they give me very precise. They got RAN, I get initial sound, phonemic segmentation. I get the alphabet, I get a composite score. You have to do it all by hand. Um, but then every tool is... That one is uh, through eighth grade for sure. And it has a pre-K component. Um, that Most has people been... don't realize that a cadence was Dibbles. They yes. sold Dibbles and then started a cadence. So they're the same people. Yes, yes, they're yes. They're doing the same good things. You know? Yes. So um... the, the difference with the cadence reading, it has, has a metric in it. It's called Pathways of Progress and it monitors your effectiveness as a teacher. And so... Um, all the teachers I know want to know if they're making an impact on children's lives. That's a whole nother talk, but that, that tool is there and it's powerful. You're pretty humbled when you see your, your children are not progressing in your classroom. Right. When you do that metric, you're like, well, right. okay. So my instruction is not it's working hard when you're in this microcosm and mm -hmm. you hear other people going, you know, I have the low class and I, oh, you know, my kids are doing, you know, cause it's their perception. They have the low class, mm -hmm. you know, and, and. When so I you do have to have outside known data. I, I show them everybody else's because even within the school, you don't have the low class. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so that those perceptions sometimes when we don't have the vantage point to see everything else, you know, it's, yes. it doesn't, you know, change our instruction. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think every teacher I know, well, 99% of them, um, they want to do a better job. They want to do a good job. They don't want to do, they don't want to waste their time, you nope. know. No, nope. we're there to change lives, not make money. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. And so, so, you know, if there's a, is there a tool out there? You know, the ones that I, I showed you are all really, I think like the all is cost effective. Uh, early bird is cost effective. The, the early bird and prize just haven't been completely validated. They're both going to be validated for preschool through eight years of age. Remember what's good for an eighth grader isn't exactly the same thing that's good for a four-year-old. So we have to get realistic about what our tools are supposed to be assessing. You know, what's an eighth grader? Um, yeah, I want to know RAN. I want to know a few things what that student has been doing, but I'll first just do an oral reading fluency and see what their accuracy is. And then I'll just back the card up and be like, all right, we don't have accuracy. So I got to go to phonics. All right, I don't have phonics. I got to go to phonemic awareness. 
all right, don't have that. I go to RAN. So I just keep backing up. And if I have the tools in my pocket that have been, you know, there and readily accessible because they've been free, um, that's really helpful. You can't always get that when you have a computer adaptive assessment, but you can if you have just some curriculum based measurements in your hand. They have great prediction power. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then they're asking about like the orthography. Mm -hmm. you know, AKA spelling assessments. Mm -hmm. um, are there any that you put a lot of stock into? I know a lot of people use them and backtrack from spelling because mm -hmm. you could do yeah. it. Whole group. A nice diagnostic. It's a more of a word study approach and you're looking at their phonological skill. I think um, spelling in, in my experience and what I use spelling is always part of a data set. I don't use it as my, I can use it as a great, like, okay, I see I have some phonological problems. I have some orthographic mapping problems, um, meaning, uh, sorry, they're not taking the orthographic information and getting it onto the paper. So it's a phonics instruction problem. Right. And they might not have ample amount of rehearsal. They might not be, you know, they might be memorizing words instead of actually practicing and studying lexical quality, building this quality representation for the how the sound maps to the print. So I try to look at spelling with a very broad brush about like, what is it telling me about instruction? What is it telling me about the phonemic awareness skills of a student? What's it telling me about the phonics skills, how they're taking that orthographic information? Um, morphological information. And that is just part of the pie. Yes. And poor, remember, dyslexia is defined by that poor word reading and spelling. So yeah, it's part of the pie. We got to have it. I just didn't know if you had a particular assessment. No, I mean, I, I've used everything from words their way. There's one in a cadence now. Um, there's a, a group of assessments that my colleague Bruce wrote. Um, you know, there's so there's there's a few out there. Yeah, um, yeah. Because the putting the morphology piece into it, you can see where they're phonetic spellers, but they don't know what the meaning is. No, nope. so it's not going to work. That's right. Um, okay, so when you have low ran, what can you do about it? So RAN isn't something that you just change. It's um, something, you know, we are born with the processing system, just like you buy a computer that was like the 2.0 model. You didn't get the five, you got the 2.0. Um, and so our, what RAN teaches us about students is a really incredible article. So listen, um, it's by Norton and Wolf um, and they, it's 2014, it's accessible free online. Uh, it talks to you a lot about what do you do. Children who have RAN need lots of rehearsal and practice to really store the information so that they can efficiently retrieve it. But if they are only seeing something a few times and then we expect them to retrieve it, it's like super, like it's not stuck there. It's not retrieving. Um, so they just, there's, there's a different level of, um, input that needs to occur for students with RAN difficulties. So that is really, um, I encourage you to read that article and understand that this rehearsal, uh, what we call the science of learning, that process of the I do, the we do, and the you do has to be very solid and repetitive for children who need that amount of practice. Yes, absolutely. Because it's, it's the, you know, the kids that don't need that repetition you know, they're, they just go so fast and so far and so fast and it's so hard to give those kids the opportunity to do that. So mm -hmm. your differentiation talking about that is, is critical. So, mm -hmm. so glad you, you talked about that. Um, okay. So then when you, when you talked about the, you know, language disability issue, mm -hmm. um, would in, that is not a term that is really used a lot here. Where right. I live. So, um, it's not across the nation. As, hmm? It's not across the nation. It's, right. So would you um, you know, even bring that in as a as a topic for when you're going in to meet about kids when like in Georgia, it's very hard to get somebody to use the term dyslexia. So I don't often bring that. Yeah. So the two things I would say in this, uh, it's a very good question. Was there uh, there is a a, 
I brought the word reading continuum up for you so you could understand like autism, we're on a continuum and the kid, children who have severe and very impacted word reading, just call it that if you can't call it dyslexia. You right. know what? Just these students are severe. They have severe word reading difficulties. And then you can be like, otherwise known as dyslexia. You know, <laughs> um, you know it's I like, I want you to know that you have to know this so you can navigate for those children who really need you to navigate for them. And the second thing is that language is a foundation of everything we do, how you're listening to me, how you're processing is based on your language skills, your vocabulary, your understanding of the teaching process, the understanding of the reading brain. You have stored that in language. And so to not talk about language, it's like, you know, I mean, not talking about running and you're at a track meet. I say it all the time. I mean, I can decode beautifully in Spanish, but I don't know a lot of words, so it's not going to help me much. <laughs> I know the phonics, but no one ever, you know, if I read the newspaper, no, no one ever taught me about machinery of war with, you know, if I'm talking about it, <laughs> you know? so I'd be like, I don't know what that is, you know, yeah. so if the vocabulary is not there, the phonics is just, you know, a waste. You have to have this complete picture. So, I mean, I, I love exactly what you're saying. And I All also right. want to reify that, that language processing, okay, if, if up to 50% of students who have word reading difficulties have these developmental language disorders, um, and about 2%, two kids in every classroom have a developmental language disorder, um, just alone, they're, they're in your room. So just say, we have students who have language processing differences. They are, they are different. Call it DLD if you want, but we need to bring awareness to this period. It's very prevalent. It's very real. Um, and oftentimes, um, because I've worked in very impoverished places, we get asked as speech language pathologists to rule out language difference versus language disorder. So is it a, is there impoverishment of language? Is it um, that they have a dialectical variation? Is it because they just haven't been talked to versus actually a true language disorder? And so just know that there are real language disorders and- um, and, it, and it gets fuzzy when you're in a situation yes. like that. You know, it's yes. like, honestly, sometimes I'm like, I don't care if you call them a purple people eater, can we, can we work on this? <laughs> They'll have language and it could be because they come from a really adverse experience right. and it, Absolutely. It, it could be entirely caused by trauma, but they still have a language difficulty. Right. So we still have to address it. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah. There is a lot of things to do, but I love, love, love everything that you said, because it is without this knowledge, we will never be as effective as we want to be. And yeah. Um, and I know we all want to be that effective. And so I just really honestly have to say thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. I wish we could answer every single question, but I don't want to keep you here all night. And um, I will send out all the information to everybody um, and give us, you know, give us a minute. So to pull it together, I haven't gotten the slides yet. And um, so I'll send you the slides and we'll get the recording. It takes a little while to upload. So, so be patient and we'll make sure you, you all have it. Um, and feel free to reach out um, with questions. I can forward them on if you want to send them to me. Um, you know, Danielle, Nell, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Nell, depending on what you want to call her. Uh, so all nice things though. Um, you can send her an email as well. Or you can come and hang out because we're both going to be a big sky. We're going to be having a great old time. <laughs> That is right. Um, thank you, everyone. I am I'm seeing your chat box. I really am glad that it hit the spot for many of you. And, and it's hopefully begging some questions within you and hopefully inspiring you to say, wow, we can know more, we can do more. Um, and, you know, really, you start digging into what you have, and you, you just take a step at a time. Yep, so absolutely. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. All right. Good night, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.